In this video, I'm going to talk about the first reason that we do statistics. And that reason is because we do not have access to the population of interest. And so what I write in a textbook is that a population includes all of the cases associated with a defined group. Now that group can be something like the entire world population, of which there are billions of cases, or it could be something smaller, like university students taking a statistics class for the first time. So whoever it is that you are wanting to infer your results to is the population of interest, and that is the group to which you want to make decisions. Researchers, however, rarely ever have access to the entire population of interest. Now, this will be certainly true if you actually want to infer results to the entire adult population of which there are billions of people. But it's also true even if you have a smaller population of interest that is more confined, like, say, university students taking a stats class for the first time, which would not amount to billions of people. It would only be millions of people. But millions is still well beyond the capacity of the typical researcher to obtain the appropriate data to represent the population. So in practice, because researchers realistically cannot get access to the population, the entire population, researchers use a much smaller group of cases as a representation of the entire population. And this is something that is a bit of a miracle or a genius element to statistics is that this actually can work very, very well to use a much smaller group of cases to represent the entire population. And what we call that smaller group of cases is a sample. So carrying on, what we do with those samples of data is that we calculate values from which we infer those results to the population. So we conduct research typically because we want to infer we want to make decisions, we want to make conclusions about how the world works or how it's different between people or related, and we want to make those inferences to large populations because we're not interested in small niche groups typically. And so we want to infer those results from the sample to the population, and that's what we call inferential statistics. And inferential statistics will form the backbone of much of this textbook, and it forms the backbone of most books on statistics. So inferential statistics is about estimating the values with samples to a population and determining how much confidence we can interpret those results. So strictly speaking, we infer results from a sample to a population if we used random sampling. Now that's an assumption of inferential statistics is that we're going to actually use random sampling. So this trick that statisticians have come up with that allows us to make decisions about entire populations with a smaller subset of data is based on random sampling. And random sampling represents a group of cases selected from the population of interest where, and this is important, each case had an equal chance of being selected into the group. Now, think for a minute what that actually means where each case in the population of interest had an equal chance or has an equal chance of being selected into that sample. So, for example, if you consider a study that wants to evaluate whether attending lectures is associated with greater performance on the final exam for university students, I would actually need to randomly sample in such a way that each student in the entire world has an equal chance of being selected into that sample. Realistically, that is not going to happen. Even coming up with a list of all the students in the world who might be taking a stats class would be an insurmountable problem. Realistically, we're not even going to get the list of students, much less even draw random names from that list, contact the students, ask them to give us the requisite information to conduct the study. And then there's the other element that, in practice, we can't force people to participate in studies. Ethically, they have a right not to participate. So random sampling is an assumption of applying this great trick of using a smaller sample to represent a population. But in practice, we cannot actually do it. And researchers rarely ever have the population of interest, and they rarely ever even have a random sample. Instead, what they use are convenience samples. And I write in a textbook that that's basically a sample that is readily accessible, and there are varying degrees of quality when it comes to convenience samples. 
if you derive a convenience sample literally from your own class in order to estimate, say, the relationship between lecture attendance and performance on the exam, that's not a very good convenience sample because it's literally just one classroom. If you could do it across a whole university, that would be a bit better. Maybe across a whole city where you derive students from multiple universities, from multiple classes, that's a better quality convenience sample. Or you might go online and you put an advertisement out and you ask people to participate in the study and you get people around the world. Now, that is still not as good as a random sample. And the extent to which that that's a problem for the results that we report in the studies that almost all use convenience samples is we don't know. We don't know how much of a problem that is. I write that in the textbook that it's not a good thing. But scientists still manage to make conclusions with data that actually impact people's lives. So penicillin, for example, or all types of antibacterial type of drugs are based on convenience samples. Other research areas, in addition to medicine and psychology and economics, etc., for the most part, they're all based on convenience samples. And science still progresses, but it's still a problem that we don't have random samples. Because we actually only have samples rather than populations, we need to evaluate or estimate the chances that we might fool ourselves into thinking that something is happening in the population when actually there's nothing going on in the population. And that's a big part of inferential statistics, is calculating that chance. What are the chances that I'm fooling myself and other people into thinking that there is something going on in the world that I'm predicting or that I'm telling that there's a difference between, and really there's nothing. And I give an example here where we might be interested in testing the difference between males and females in intelligence, a very controversial question. The answer to that would be potentially controversial, and so we have to make sure that we are not fooling ourselves into thinking there is a difference between males and females in intelligence. And we have to estimate the probability with which we might be fooling ourselves if we were to conduct a study to evaluate whether there was a difference between males and females in intelligence. And if we used a convenience sample, maybe that's a problem. But in addition to that, we need to estimate the probability that we may be fooling ourselves into thinking something is happening in the population when it actually is not. And what we call that chance or probability in statistics, we call it a p-value. And you're going to see a lot of p-values in this textbook, and you're going to see a lot of p-values published in research publications across disciplines. It's not the only way to estimate chance, but it is a very popular way to estimate chance in research. And much of this textbook is going to show you how to estimate those p-values for a variety of statistics. Now I end on the distinction between parameters and statistics. This is really just to help you understand, or at least get the labels right, so parameters are values calculated from data that represent the entire population of interest. So if I wanted to know what is the average performance on the final exam of students who take a unit with me, I can actually calculate that from the population because I have access to all the data. All the students do the final exam, or at least all the students who do the final exam, I can calculate the average for that. And that is a parameter. If I calculate the average, that's a parameter because I have the population. But when I don't have the population of interest, I'm now calculating statistics. And that's actually a key distinction in the language that researchers use between populations and samples. Now, we almost always only ever have samples, so we almost always only ever speak of statistics. So parameters, uh, much more rarely do we mention something about parameters because we just don't have the population of interest. And this is where I mentioned parameters are from populations. So statistics from samples and parameters from populations. So this is the first reason why we do statistics. It's all related to the fact that we do not have access to the population of interest and we're using samples of some sort, random or convenience, and we need to estimate the chances that we're fooling ourselves into thinking there's something going on at the population level when in fact there is nothing going on. So I'm going to cover the next reason, which is estimating the magnitude of an effect in the next video.